How many want Jesus' results? You get Jesus' results by acting like Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus said that I only do what I see the Father do, and I only say what I hear the Father say. Isn't that simple? And that simply means that you're being led by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. Brother Hagen said that there'd be a move of the Spirit that'll be lost in this generation unless we teach on it. Come on, church. Come on. Yeah. There will be a move of the Spirit that'll be lost. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to lose. Because it's not that difficult when we really think about it. It's just listening to what he says and then doing it. It starts in your personal life, what he speaks to you personally, and doing that. And then when he can entrust that you'll do what he's speaking to you for your personal life, he'll begin to entrust to you, come on. Amen. But over in Philippians chapter 3, get back on point here. Amen. Uh, let's see. Let's just start reading verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I've counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also, this is the New King James, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. One translation says that I may experience the power of his resurrection. Notice it says there to know him. It doesn't say, and I'm going to re repeat what some of the things I've said, just refreshing. It says there to know him, not know about him. Yes. To know him. To know him means something personal. It means that you actually spend time with him, and you know him, and he knows you, and you have conversations with him. <laughs> yeah. And he talks to you. And he walks with you. He communicates with you. He shows you his ways. Remember I shared last week, just from one of the songs that we did again today, I speak Jesus. And it says I speak Jesus over family, so on and so forth. And the Lord spoke to me last week, Holy Ghost spoke to me right at the end of the song where it says I speak Jesus. And it just dropped in me. It's not just speaking the name of Jesus, right. it's the language. Yes. And I shared all last week by the Holy Ghost, the unction of the Holy Ghost. Yes. Didn't have any of it in my notes, man. Never even went to my notes, but just began to share about the language of Jesus. Do you speak Jesus? <laughs> do you speak Jesus? Glory. Meaning, do you speak the language of heaven? That's speaking Glory. Jesus. Do you speak the language of Jesus? Are you proficient in the language of Jesus? Or do you know just little bits, just enough to get by? Wow. See, I don't know about you, but if you go to a, I, I know this just because of things that I've heard, but if you go to a foreign country, the more proficient you are in the language, the better you'll get around. <laughs> the better you'll be able to communicate. The, the less you'll get taken advantage of. See, you don't know the, the language of Jesus. You don't know how to speak Jesus. The enemy will come along just like he did with Jesus and try to speak something. And if you don't know the language, you'll think, well, that, huh, that must be, that's got to be Jesus. Oh, my. Come on.
come on. But to know him and to know the powers of his resurrection or to experience the power of his resurrection. How many in here have experienced the power of his resurrection? If you're born again, every hand should have went up. Because you're, if you're born again, you experienced it. Because he took out of you a dead spirit and put within you a living spirit. See, and that living spirit is from heaven, and that living spirit knows how to speak Jesus. It knows the ways of the kingdom. Come on. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 6. This is going to be, um, there's so much more that could be preached on this that I could stay on it all year long, but we're going to move on to some things next week because Pastor Dina's got something burning in her heart, and plus it's Mother's Day. I think she could do a better job preaching on Mother's Day than me. So we're going to let her do that. Amen? Amen. But just for the sake of time, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. New King James, Matthew 6 in verse 33. It says, but seek first, first, first. What's that mean, first? First. It means before anything else, seek first. It means that Kingdom life is of utmost importance to you, and you want to know everything about it that you can know about it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, we know if we back up several verses, it talks about the world, the Gentile, and what they seek after. Well, if you're born again, you're not a Gentile anymore. So if you're not a Gentile anymore, it's really he's saying there is that you need to stop seeking these things. <laughs> Come on, it's not everybody ought to take this right now and just think about, whoa, what have I been seeking? And what is Jesus saying here about seeking first the kingdom? It means that there's going to be a time in the near future. He's talking to the disciples. There, basically, you could say, paraphrase, there's going to be a time coming in the near future. He's prophesying about that he's going to be gone. And he's telling them, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to seek first. Why, why, why would he tell the disciples, the 12, that they should seek first? Because there's going to be a paradigm shift in their life that's going to take place. They're going to get born again. And they're going to need to stop thinking about natural things to be effective to have resurrection power working in them and through them, they're going to have to stop looking at, stop acting like they've always acted and looked. And he's saying here, he's saying, seek first the kingdom, which means you're going to have to put forth some effort to find out what does kingdom life and kingdom living look like. See, the whole purpose of us e even coming on Sunday mornings or going to special conferences or at spending time at home in the Word ourselves, listening to our favorite preachers or whatever, is hopefully to get out of it what kingdom life looks like and then applying that to our lives Amen. so that we can begin to function in it. Right. It's not to get a bunch of knowledge and quote Scripture. It's actually to change our lifestyle. We're to have a new lifestyle that's called the kingdom lifestyle. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. See, that ought to be exciting because the lifestyle, the way of life, the new language that we're to learn is victorious language and victorious living. If we're not seeing victory in our certain arenas of our life, or not experiencing maybe the fullness of what the Bible talks about, maybe we're trying to mix our old way of living with kingdom living. And you'll get limited results. You will. 
You get limited results when you try to bring this life into kingdom life and think that you can mix it up. I, remember, hear what I said. I didn't say you won't get any results. I said you'll get limited results. To get kingdom results, you've got to live like the kingdom. That's why the scriptures talk about dying to self. Why are you dying to self? Because you're saying, the way I used to live, and, and, and hear me in this, because this is vitally important. We are so good at thinking about all of the, if I can say it this way, the big negatives. Well, I don't drink anymore. I don't do drugs anymore. I don't sleep around anymore. I don't do this anymore. That's easy stuff. Yeah, the better word yet. That's obvious stuff. Now, there may be some in here that are still battling with that. But you know, God will help you. I said, God will help you with anything. But notice here in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus, if you back up a few scriptures, Jesus is not talking about those obvious things. <laughs> He's not talking about those. He's, he, back up to verse 25, it says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink. You mean, I need to stop thinking about what I'm going to eat or drink? Yeah. <laughs> you mean to tell me, Pastor, that I need to stop thinking about where I'm going to go for lunch after the service? Yeah. <laughs> My stomach's growling. What can I, I can't help that. Oh, yeah, you can. Seek first. Amen. <laughs> Notice he's not talking about the heinous things that we consider our sin or those things that are contrary to the kingdom. He's talking about everyday life. Yeah, that's what he said. He's talking about everyday life. He said, stop thinking about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Stop thinking about the clothes. You know, the clothes are not the issue here. <laughs> How many know that he's getting right down to the nitty-gritty of our life? Yeah, That's what he's talking about. He's saying everything that you considered important in your life, stop thinking about that. Because if your mind and your attention is focused on that, that's all you're going to see. And that's where all of your attention is going to be focused on. But he says, when he gets down to, well, before he gets down to verse 33, he says, take no thought of these things, saying. Which means... Remove them even out of your conversation. Like, what? <laughs> now, does that mean you can never talk about your favorite restaurant? No. Come on, no. But that shouldn't be our main focus when we even get together as the body of Christ is to get together and talk about, wow, you know, the, I went to this restaurant. And right now I'm talking about myself. Do you know, man, that the waves were so good the last few days that, oh, my gosh, I can't wait till I get back to the water again. There ain't no kingdom business in that unless you're doing kingdom business in the midst of it. <laughs> What's your purpose? What's your motive? Where's your heart? Yeah. He says, take no thought saying. Where's your heart? Then he goes on to say, Seek first the kingdom, which means seek first kingdom life. Seek first a kingdom lifestyle. What does that look like? We need to become proficient in what kingdom life is. Amen? When anybody comes to this country, or if you were to go to another country, whichever, to get the most out of it, 
And to become a citizen of it, you have to learn the ways. You have to learn their constitution or how they operate in things and begin to function like they function within their country. Same with anybody that comes to the United States. Anybody that comes to the United States and wants to become a United States citizen, they are put through classes. They have to learn the language, or they're supposed to learn the language. They're supposed to learn the language. They are to learn the Constitution. They are to learn the Bill of Rights. They learn history of our forefathers, the framers of the Constitution. They learn why the four, our forefathers came here. They, they learn the foundation of what the United States of America stands for. They learn all that. And for anybody that does that and learns that, we know by a gentleman that we met back a couple of years ago uh, that came from another country. I won't say where he came from because that has no bearing on it. He just came from another country. And he came to this country because he wanted better life. And when he went through all of the protocols that were necessary to become a citizen, he said it just it revolutionized everything about the way he thought, the way he acted. But even before he learned that, he knew, and see, this, we, can, we can appropriate this to ourselves because even before we know everything, when we get born again, all of us could in here could say, we know something changed. And this gentleman we were speaking with said when he flew over to the United States, he says when he landed and he got off the plane and walked off the plane just being in the United States, he said he dropped to the ground and kissed the ground and thanked God that he was here. He knew something there was already, that there was an oppression lifted off of him. Do you know when you get born again, there's oppression yeah. that is lifted off of you. But then he went through, and, he, and he, couldn't, he couldn't understand as we were talking with him. He was just sharing with us the, the current uh, climate of the United States. I'll just put it that way. And he couldn't understand how people that were born here could speak and do and say and everything, some of the things that they were. He said, because if you ever came from something, he says, came where I came from, he said, oh, my gosh. Seeing all of us becoming kingdom citizens. It's like we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Yes. <laughs> and I remember what this gentleman said. There was no way that he would ever want to go back to where he came from. Yes. Yes. Never. When we understand... What Jesus has provided for us through the resurrection power. When we understand the life that Jesus has provided for us, a new life, a kingdom life, when we understand and we become more proficient in it, there's no way we would ever want to go back and participate or be a part of or even draw from. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But notice it says there in Matthew 6 and 33, it says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, which means you're seeking kingdom life. And then the second part says, and his righteousness, which means it literally, the definition is, being right means the way of doing and being right. There's a way to do kingdom life. I said there's a way to do kingdom life. It's not just about walking around quoting, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. Because if you are, there's a way of doing righteousness. And you can do righteousness because you are righteous. There it is. Yeah. There's a way of doing righteousness. And if you're born again, you are righteous. Yeah. So which means you, you know, know how, how to, to do it. it. You, you just, just may have, have to stir it up a little bit. And you may have to know what it is. 
and know how to walk in it. But I heard one preacher say one time that there's just things, when you get born again, there's just things that you know how to do because it's in your nature, because you've been given a new nature. So you could say it's kind of been bred into you. You know, dogs don't have to learn how to bark. Do you know, as a puppy, once they find out they've got a voice, they bark. <laughs> Amen? If you've ever hunted and a, a bird dog, a bird dog just knows how to fetch and point. They'll do it automatically. We've had a number of them in our family, uh, German short hairs. And do you know that with a German short hair, you can take them out when they're puppies, and it doesn't have to be very long. You can take them out in the field, and they'll run up, get, get on the scent or something, they'll run up, and they'll just point. And they've never been trained to do it. Why? Because it's in them. Yeah. Do you know there's certain things in you as a born-again child of God? But when it says seek first, it means begin to develop Develop those things. Because like with the dogs that we've had in our family over the years, if you don't develop it, I would just say it this way. If you don't develop and help teach them and train them in the things that is just evident on the inside of them, they'll just run around in the field like knotheads all their life. There is a way that you can control, if I can say it this way. I'm not talking about controlling, you understand. But there is a way that you can teach them to where when they go out there, They'll get a scent, they'll go up, and they'll just point. And they won't move off that point until you tell them move off that point. They'll sit there. And while they're sitting there, man, because it's so in them, they'll even sit there, and if you walk up, until you give them the command to go in and, and flush that bird, they'll sit there, and the longer you stand there and wait for them, because I've done it before, they'll sit there, and pretty soon they just... <laughs> because they want to so bad. It's just like, you don't understand, Master. This is what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> what does that say to us? <laughs> when you know to do some things, wait on the Holy Ghost. Wait on the Holy Ghost. but I just want to get in there. But he'll let you in there. But there's a time. There's an appointed time. Amen. Glory to God. We're talking about resurrection power working through your life. Resurrection power working through your life. And it's not just through a bunch of words. We know that 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 20, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church, and he said it's not just about talk, but it's about demonstration of power. Yes. That ought to help some of us in here today to know that it's more than just quoting a scripture. Do you know it's more than just quoting a scripture? Yeah. It's quoting a scripture with the expectation of the power to be released and God doing something through you. Amen. Amen. It's about God working through you. It's about God working through you. And he's just looking for somebody that'll say, use me, Lord. Use me. I'm your man. I'm your woman. Use me. I'm not going to put my responsibility on anybody else. Use me. <laughs> Woo! Glory. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, use me, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. He's ready to use you in your arena and in the realm that you have influence in. Ha, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he's ready to use everybody in the arena and the realm that they're in. Thank you, Jesus. It's not about having all your ducks in a row and making sure everything is right. It's about just opening up your life and letting his rightness work through you and in you. Because in God's eyes, you're already right. I said, in God's eyes, you're already right. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You are, but you don't understand. You know, I don't need to understand. What I do understand is that in God's eyes, you're already right. If you're a born-again child of God, you're already right. Say, I'm already right. I'm already right. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And the things that he's calling you to do is not so you can be right because you're already right. The things he's calling you to do and the things he's calling you to say is because he wants to put on demonstration his rightness that he's already placed in you. Amen. He wants to show off through you. I say he wants to show off through you. <laughs> but if you think you're lacking... If you think you come up short, if you think you haven't been in the word long enough, if you think you haven't prayed enough, if you think you haven't listened to enough messages and enough sermons, come on. If that's what you think, that means what Jesus did wasn't enough. That means you have to do something more to accomplish or receive that which Jesus, what the Holy Spirit has for you. You say, well, pastor, how can you say that? Well, over in Luke chapter 9, it talks about, actually, in, it's in Matthew chapter 10 as well, 10 verse 1, and then in Luke 9, uh, it's a parallel scriptures, but it's talking about the 12 that Jesus sent out. Well, let's turn over there. Luke chapter 9. Let's just read it. Let's see what the, what the scripture says. Sometimes I'll just throw stuff out there and that's all right. And then other times we just really need to look at it. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Luke chapter 9, verse 1. It says, then he, talking about Jesus, says, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach, to preach, to preach. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick says there that he gave them power and authority. They weren't born again. You are. They didn't have the Holy Ghost like you got, but they do. But it shows you what Jesus was able to accomplish with a bunch of men that weren't even born again. So that pretty much eliminates your thought of, well, I've not done this enough or I've not. They hadn't really done anything. That was pretty early on in Jesus' ministry. It also puts that, well, you know, I just need to be in the Word a little bit longer. Uh, no, you don't. Come on, help us. Well, you know, I just need to listen to some more sermons. Uh, no, you don't. Well, I'm not like you. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> if you're born again, you are. Well, you don't know what I've done or what's going on in my life. Doesn't make any difference. What was going on in their life? They weren't even born again. <laughs> they weren't even born again. Which means the forgiveness of sins the way we know it, the blood of Jesus had not even been shed. And Jesus still entrusted them with the power and authority. Jesus was simply putting to showing them that there's going to be a day coming, if you, if you know the context even of the Gospels, 
There's going to be a day coming where I'm not going to be here anymore, and I'm going to send the Holy Spirit unto you. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, because we know what the Scripture says, you're going to be endued with power, which is the same power that I'm giving you right now. So I'm going to let you practice and use it in my presence. (laughs) Because he goes on in the Scriptures, and when he starts talking about the Holy Ghost, that I've got to go... We know in John, John chapter 10, 14, 15, 16, those three chapters talking about the Holy Ghost. And Jesus tells the disciples, he says, it's better off if I go. Because if I go, if I don't go, I can't send you the power. Because he's, he's he, well, the Holy Spirit, but that's power. I can't send you the Holy Spirit, which is going to be the power. The power is administered through the Holy Ghost. Through you. Because that Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit... God's spirit is going to come and live on the inside of you, which is the anointing of God, the power of God. So Jesus is just setting an example. He's showing the 12, this is what's going to happen. But then you go on, there's other places in the scriptures where it talks about, then he did it with 70. He just didn't do it with the 12. There's an example of now that he sent out 70 to do the same thing. So that means he took another 70 at some point and said, now that you've seen and witnessed what the 12 could do, now who else wants it? And 70 of them said, hey, I'll do that. (laughs) And Jesus said, all right, come here. And he gave them power. So now the way I would say it, because it doesn't say that the 12 were the same as the 70, so I would like to think that now there's 82 of them that are like, wow, we know how to operate in this power. It's pretty cool. I mean, they even came back to Jesus and they said, <laughs> can you imagine? Jesus, the Messiah, who's already been doing miracles in front of them, he gives them power and authority. And they come back and they go, you can't believe what happened. We cast out demons. And Jesus is like, yeah. <laughs> we laid hands on the sick and they recovered. Jesus is like, yeah. They're telling Jesus, do you know what happens when you exercise this power? Could you have Jesus standing there going, really? (laughs) I had no idea. (laughs) Isn't it cool how God functions? Before the born-again experience even takes place, before the infilling of the Holy Ghost, he sets them up and shows them an example. This This is what's going to happen when I leave. And anybody who puts their trust in me and gets baptized in the Holy Ghost. Anybody. Because see, the 12 or the 70, they weren't called yet as far as pastors, evangelists. They weren't even part of the family of God in one sense. Not even part of the family of God. And Jesus was able to turn that situation around in their lives and send them out to do the works of Jesus. Do the works of heaven, really. It's the works of the kingdom. That's why even when Jesus says, the works that I do, you'll do also, and greater works than these. We even sometimes, I would say it this way, because really how we speak is very important. We'll say, well, go out and do the works of Jesus. It's not the works of Jesus. It's the works of heaven. Yeah. It's the works of the Father. Because Jesus in his own words said, I only do what I see the Father do. So they're not the works of Jesus. Yes, Jesus did works, but them works are actually the works of heaven. They're the works of the Father. Jesus was doing his Father's work. Yeah. Well, if we're a son or a daughter of the Father then what works are we doing? We're doing the works of the Father. Come on. Jesus even said in the scriptures, don't pray to me, pray to the Father. We pray in his name, meaning we're using his authority when we come to the Father, but we're praying to the Father. We're not asking Jesus to do anything. We're just coming in that authority. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, over to Acts. I'm going to keep an eye on the time because we, we're going to receive communion today. Acts chapter 6. Well, actually, before 
So you can get to Acts chapter 6, but then also go to Acts chapter 10. Because I want to look at Jesus' life first, just something that... You guys know these scriptures, I know, but you know what? We can never know them enough. And really, if we say we know them, but if they're not being evident in our life, maybe we don't know them as well as we think we know them. That would be my question to any of us. Is it's, it's one thing to walk around and boast about how well we know the Bible, but if the Bible is not being demonstrated through our life, if the kingdom is not being demonstrated through our life, then maybe we don't know it quite as well as we think we know it. Maybe it's still just mental assent or doctrine. Come on. That's right, locating yourself. And just being honest, it's like, you know, there's nothing wrong with locating yourself and going, you know, maybe I really don't know as well as I think I know. And then we're going to see that in, in Acts chapter 6. But in Acts chapter 10, just for the sake of time, Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed. Notice it does not say that he anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and power so that he could become a recluse and just trust God that the power would keep him whole, complete, forgiven. You say, what do you, what do you mean by that, Pat? I'm saying about it's time that the body of Christ stops focusing on themselves and using the power that's been given. Do you notice that when Jesus gave the 12 power and he gave the 70 power, he didn't say, now go and exercise upon each other the power. No, he said, go and demonstrate this to people that don't have the power. If you got the power, there's really no reason for us to demonstrate on each other. <laughs> but yet we've become very accustomed to demonstrating on one another. Come on. Can we all be honest that the church has become very comfortable about demonstrating upon one another? But we don't see anywhere in the scriptures for the most part. There are certain instances where uh, God talks about calling for the elders of the church, anoint them with oil. The elders go on, a, there's an anointing of oil that takes place. So I'm not saying that we don't, aren't there for one another, but it's very limited in the scriptures where God talks about a believer going to a believer. And if you think about all the other scriptures in context, why would a believer go to a believer? Because if you're a believer, why do you need to go to another believer? <laughs> to receive something that you already have. But it says here that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went and did good. My wife has a much better teaching on this, but it talks about doing good, is a, talking about being a philanthropist, going and helping people. It says, and healing all who were oppressed. Well, healing oppressed people doesn't necessarily mean just physical healing. Oppression comes in many forms and fashions. It just means that the, the overwhelmingness of darkness is trying, has got you down. It could be in your physical body through sickness. It could be uh, in your mind through depression in your soul. It, it can come in many arenas, but it's basically darkness is trying to keep you from being who God says you are to be. Amen. How many know people that are oppressed? How many know believers that are oppressed? Come on. It's true. <laughs> well, if you're going to be a believer going to another believer, as I we talked about earlier, that is the purpose for going to another believer because they don't know how to get free from the oppression. Come on. But along with helping them get free, Helping them get free is, is also helping them understand that they've got the power in the Holy Ghost and they don't have to slip back, back into that again. That when you're not there, they can call on the name of Jesus yeah. and, make a, and make a draw from the power. Yeah. 
that's on the inside of them and be set free. See, we become too dependent upon people in the church. You say, well, is it wrong that I call, that I have my pastor lay hands on me? No, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying God wants us to raise up to a place to stop thinking about us. We didn't get saved so we could just think about us. Notice, remember the scripture says dying to self. It's not just about us. It's not so we can live a better life. It's not so that we can live in a better house. It's not so that we can drive a better car. Come on. <laughs> Come on. It's not so that we can pay, take better vacations. <laughs> it's not so we can wear better clothes. It's not so that we can transition from hamburgers and hot dogs to filet mignon. Remember, Matthew chapter 6 says, don't take any thought of them things. Take thought about kingdom life and all that stuff, man, it'll be dealt with. It'll be taken care of. It'll just be taken care of. But we focus too much on, uh, on, on trying to release power for ourselves. And God is saying, no, 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 you, you're getting it all wrong. You're getting it all wrong. I've already given you the power. You need to focus on releasing the power so other and, yeah. and teaching and discipling people so they know they've got power. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it says that God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and the power who went about doing good and healing all that were pressed. Now over Matthew or over Acts chapter 6. This is where the rubber meets the road. Because it's talking about everyday folks, just like you and I. Everyday believers. This is the acts of the early church. It's the acts of the Holy Ghost operating through everyday folks. This is the story of Stephen. We've all probably read the story of Stephen. If you haven't, you're about to read it for the first time. Praise the Lord. But it says here, Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. You could say there was a problem with the Greek-speaking believers against the Hebrew-speaking believers, yeah. but it was all believers, but there was a grumbling within the church. Yeah. Say it isn't so. <laughs> They had it in the first church, and I can tell you that there's a, it's in the church today. <laughs> and notice here, <laughs> I'm just going to bring this up, because we were just talking about this. Notice here, as you go on to read, we'll see, that the grumbling didn't take place with the people to the leaders. It was amongst themselves. Really? <laughs> Let that be a lesson there to you. If you're, I don't really like what the pastor does, and there's a lot of stuff that could be done better, and I don't think it's being done the right way. I don't really care if you think it's being done the right way. If you want it done a different way, then you become the pastor. But guess what? You're not the pastor at Thriving Life. <laughs> So I really don't care what you think. Because I give account to him, not to you. Does that mean I won't listen? No. You've got something, bring it to me. But don't get mad if, you, if I go like, yeah, that sounds good, but sorry. It doesn't fit. It's okay. Amen? Okay, let's stop meddling. Come on. Verse 2, it says, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and says, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. Yeah. Come on, you want to be in ministry? Come on. And I'm not talking five full ministry. I'm talking about just being used, used of God. God. Good. 
pick out seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Notice it says full. Full. Well, full, we know according to the scriptures, without going to the teachings, is more than a one-time thing. It's meaning that you're living a kingdom life in, in a matter in such a way that you're keeping yourself full of God. Yeah. And it takes an effort to keep yourself full of God. Yeah. Amen. If you come on Wednesday night, you'll get in a conversation that we're talking about not being entangled in the affairs of this life. And being full. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because it will keep you from being full. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So it's talking about men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. Yeah. And wisdom. What's that mean? Full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Full of the Holy Spirit and the understanding or the know-how on how to use the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. Yeah. It's not just walking around, throwing a bunch of scriptures around like you know everything in the Bible, but you don't really apply it to your own life, nor do you know how to apply it to anybody else's life. It's just bragging about, well, you know, <laughs> the Bible says, well, good, I know what the Bible says too. But what's it saying to you? How is that what you're telling me what the Bible says? Give me a testimony of how it's working in your life. Well, Paul says, I know what Paul says, and I know Paul's testimonies because I can read them. So Paul's testimony ain't your testimony. What's your testimony? Well, Brother Hagin says, hey, I know exactly what Brother Hagin says, and that's Brother Hagin's testimony. So now what's your testimony? That's Holy Spirit and wisdom. That means the application of to the word that you've been taught, to the word that you've heard, to the word that's been given to you, you've now applied it to your life, and you're also beginning to walk in it and have your own testimonies. Yeah. Right. Remember I said we started out Philippians chapter 3. Verse 10, to know Jesus and experience the power of his resurrection. That's exactly what they're talking about here in Acts chapter 6. Yeah. They're talking about pick out seven men that know Jesus or know the Holy Ghost yeah. and wisdom who have experienced the power for themselves yeah. because now they know what the power is. It's not just talked about, but they actually know what the power is and they know how to now disperse it. Come on. And then it goes on, verse 4, it says, But we, meaning the apostles, the twelve, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. Please the whole multitude. The whole multitude. I'm not going to go anywhere there. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And Philip, and I'm not going to butcher these names. There's, a, there's, there's several other guys here that they picked out. And it's, it's okay. Bill, Tom, <laughs> Harry, Jerry. <laughs> Nick is there. Nick's there. <laughs> Even, even Tim. Tim's there. Tim's there. Tim's there. <laughs> but they picked us at whom they said before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread. Then the word of God spread. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power. Full of faith and power full of faith and power. Just an average Joe, full of faith and power. Do you notice that they didn't say, pick out several among you who are the best bus boys in the bunch? It says who are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Notice the natural arena of what they were called to do was of no meaning. It was like they can do, you, you'll do a good job in the natural if you're full of Holy Ghost and wisdom. Right. Good reputation. You know, are you faithful in that which is another man's? Come on. Good reputation. Are you a team player? Come on. Have you got things on the inside of you that you know you can just do to serve and help out? 
Come on. Or are you of the mentality, well, I've been saved X number of years, been there, done that. I don't do that anymore. Well, you know what? I heard one preacher saying, I like it. He said that if, I want to make sure I quote it right. <laughs> if you won't do anything, you're not qualified to do anything. If you're not willing to do anything, you're not qualified to do anything. You say, well, I don't see that in the scripture. Well, don't you know? Jesus cleaned feet. <laughs> the Son of God. Jesus didn't say, you know, I came in here and I've been doing miracles now. Y'all don't understand. I've been doing miracles and uh, I don't lower myself to these things anymore because, you know, I'm the son of God and I've healed sick people. I've raised up dead people. I've turned water into wine. I've done all this. My reputation goes before me. So now there's some feet washing that needs to be done here because there's an aroma in the room. <laughs> Y'all get on over here. Tend to that because it's not me. I came as a servant, but I have gone beyond that now because I'm about to go to the cross. If you're not willing to do anything, you're not qualified to do anything. Come on now. Getting quiet in this house. Woo! But it notice, I, I'm going to go back to it. It says, they did not say pick out the best table waiters. It says pick out people that have a good reputation, that are full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and who are just willing. They were just willing to do anything. Because you don't see anything about us like, well, I don't want to do it. You're going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Okay, we're going to pick seven of you. No, don't pick me, man. I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm not waiting on them tables. Do you know that them Greek-speaking believers, they're a bunch of grumbling, no good for nothings, man. I've heard them talk. I'm not waiting on their table. I know exactly what will happen if I wait on their table. I'll go to that table, and they're going to say, well, yeah. No, it didn't make any difference. They picked out seven amongst themselves. And then the, the leaders laid hands on them and prayed for them and sent them out to do the task. And Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost and power, right in the middle of doing, waiting on tables, he's laying hands on the sick and ministering Jesus. Right in the middle of showers going on on a Thursday morning, laid hands on somebody and watched healing take place. Right in the middle of, right in the middle of, right in the middle of. Well, yeah, but pastor, I want to stand up on Sunday morning and I want, to, I want to lay hands on the sick. Why? There's a whole lot more that goes on out there. Well, pastor, you don't understand. I, 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 I do this and I do that. I don't really care. Well, okay, maybe I'll show up on such and such a day, but I'm just going to stand back and be led by the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so it's like, well, while you're being led, why don't you uh, serve up a couple plates of food and, and scrub the bathroom and keep the bathroom clean while our guests are here? No, 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 because that would interfere with me being led by the Holy Ghost and hearing him. <laughs> no, I can't do that. Sometimes stuff like this needs to be taught. We're talking about the power, and everybody wants, uh, I say everybody, everybody wants power, everybody wants to function in the power, but do you see what came along with functioning in the power? Jesus was a servant. He functioned in the power. Paul was a servant, and he functioned in the power. Peter was a servant, and he functioned in the power. Stephen was a servant, and he functioned in the power. Philip was a servant, and he functioned in the power. Come on. Everybody wants to function in the power, and the power is available. But what are you going? What are you willing to put your hands to? See, Jesus came. He says, "I was about the Father's business." 
Being about the Father's business is more than just laying hands on the sick. Being about the Father's business is feeding the homeless sometimes. Yeah. Being about the Father's business is doing stuff with the, the Breeze Hill ministry like we do. Being about the Father's dis business is standing at the front door and greeting. Being about the Father's business is being an usher. Being about the Father's business is working back in the cafeteria. Being about the Father's business is coming up to the pastor and saying, uh, I noticed that there's duck, some cobwebs in certain areas and some dust i've noticed on the shelves and that what day are you going to be up here pastor because i'd like to come up here and while you're in, in the word and in prayer in the office i want to do some dusting and some scrubbing of the toilets there you go or the you say well no that, that that that's not the father's business yeah it is because it's the father's house come on. <laughs> Ooh, it's still quiet in this house Sometimes messages just like have to be preached because along with all the, yeah, whoo, hallelujah, power of God, <laughs> raised from the dead, cast out demons, sickness leave, comes all the other parts. Yeah. Ministry, W-O-R-K. Yeah, as we were taught, ministry is spelled W-O-R-K. Come on, and I'm not pointing the finger at any one person in here. You know if you fit the category of qualification. I know that Jesus qualified you. I understand it. I know that the blood of Jesus qualified you. I do understand that. But there are scriptures talking about being faithful with that which is another man's. There are scriptures that talk about what have you done with the talents that God's given you. Well, I didn't do anything with them. You know, I just hid them away. You know, there's all kinds of scriptures. I can lead you to all the scriptures. I know that you're qualified. I know that the blood qualified you. I know that his death, burial, and resurrection qualified you. I know that that blood is in the holy of holies. I know that you can come in boldly and stand before him because you're qualified. I know all that. I know that you're forgiven. But to be righteous means there's works of righteousness. Yeah. And those are the works of righteousness. And the works of righteousness release power. Without going into any more, you can turn over to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, 17, and 18, where it talks about that the preaching of the gospel is the power unto salvation, and it goes on to talk about righteousness and knowing your righteousness. Come on. Guys, until the church recognizes that that's the part for all of us to play and to function and all of that, we, we want to pick and choose. You're not a picker and a chooser. I mean, you can be a picker and a chooser. But really, the Holy Ghost is the picker and the chooser. He'll pick for you and he'll choose for you. And we either accept the assignment or we don't. I mean, even, even in the world, the military and the corporate world and everything understands that. You just don't walk in to a business, a corporation, and go, uh, yeah, you know the seat that the guy sits in at the Top floor in the corner, the big one that's really plush. I'm coming in, I'm gonna get, I need a job, and I'm going to take that space. I go, no, you won't. Well, yeah, I will. No, you're going to start in the mailroom. No, 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 no. You don't understand what I've done for the last 10 years. I'm not going in the mailroom. Well, if you're coming here to work, you're going to start in the mailroom. The military, when you sign up, you know, <laughs> Eddie, when you went into the military, and you sign the papers, and the first day you showed up, just say, uh, where's my suit and my brass? Because these guys that were on the bus with me, I feel like I'm led to tell them what to do, where to go, and how to act. <laughs> Did that fly? No. <laughs> and you can be in the military for 15 or 20 years and may never get to a place. <laughs> Oh, Peter, I know it. Now I know what you're talking about. Peter, <laughs> you're in the military. <laughs> do you get to pick and choose what you want to do, where you want to go, and how you're going to function? What would happen if you did? <laughs> Not going to go well, is it? Matter of fact, you might even get demoted and go back to some of the things that you didn't want to do anymore. It's just like, I guess you didn't learn anything from when we took you out of that spot, moved you to this spot. Maybe we need to send you back to that spot to, to learn <laughs> submission, to learn the lines of authority. 
Remember, Remember what, what I, I said, said last week? week? Yeah. Is to have authority, you have to be under authority. If you ever think in the body of Christ that you've arrived, we're now, shh. Guess what? You just lost your position of authority. And I've met a number of people that are just like, well, you know what? Uh, I've arrived, and the only person I listen to is the Holy Spirit. It's like, really? Well, God bless you and good luck. <laughs> yes, I know we all hear for the Holy Spirit for ourselves. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that everything has to come through uh, somebody in the body of Christ that has Christ in them because the Holy Spirit can speak to you directly. But the reason why, there's a reason why God set things in order. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Right. Right. Amen. I didn't really have any intention to kind of go in this direction, but I, it must be the Holy Ghost because, I mean, I, I got out some of the things started in the direction that, that the Spirit of God wanted me to go sharing some things. But to kind of get in here with the with basically a ministry of helps, yeah. Uh, yeah. thing because it's guys, it's really I say all this because it's like to function. I mean, Stephen is one of the greatest examples. Here's just an everyday guy, you know, a church going member, <laughs> uh, just a believer. As Roger shared earlier, just he's just a believer. And being just a believer and saying, hey, I'm good with it. You picked me. I'm good with it, man. doesn't make any difference what I'm doing. In the middle of doing it, I'm going to do what a believer does. Yeah. The platform isn't determined whether or not the power is released. The, the power is released because in whatever you're doing, you know that the Holy Spirit is about advancing the kingdom and advancing yeah. righteousness. Yeah. And setting captives free and healing those that are oppressed of the enemy. Amen. Because because I'll tell you, this platform here is just a tiny, minute, little, teeny, weeny, little bit of the everyday life and platform that we all have. That's your platform. That's your platform. That's why Jesus said in Acts 1:8, He says, Go to the upper room. Wait till you be endued with power. Then go into all the world and be witnesses unto me, meaning demonstrators of the power. Yeah. Demonstrators of the power. Not just talking about the goodness of Jesus, which is vitally important because that's the good news that he overcame death, burial, and resurrection. But while you're going into all the world, meaning the platform of everyday life, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing in everyday life, Take every opportunity in everyday life to release and administer the power of God. But to be able to do that, there are some things why, why the 12 said, pick out seven among you who are full. Full. I don't know if you're like me, I can only speak on myself. There's been times where I've not kept myself full and be in a situation and kind of like, I don't know what to do. You almost feel like you're handcuffed. You know there's things to do, but it's just like you don't even know what to do. Well, full. Full. When you're full, you know what to do. <laughs> when you're full, there's boldness. When you're full, you don't question. When you're full, it's just like, yeah. You see the bondages. You see the difficulties. You see the challenges that people are going through. And you deal with them. Yeah. Just like Roger's testimony. He saw, a child, he saw a difficulty that a child of God, maybe a child of God, maybe not. But regardless, it is God's creation. He saw somebody that was being oppressed by the devil. Because that was oppression. Had a sore wrist. That was oppression saw oppression and said, hey, wait a minute. God's anointed me with the Holy Ghost and with power. And I'm going to go and do some good and bring some healing to an oppressed man. I'm going to go 
and do some good and bring healing to an oppressed man. Glory. I said, I'm going to go and do some good and bring a healing to an oppressed man. I'm going to go and do some good and bring some healing to an oppressed man. Father, I thank you right now in the name of Jesus for a healing, anointing, and a miracle, a miracle working to go on within this body and set the captive free, been bound by what the... Ha-ha. The doctors have told you one thing, but I would tell you another thing. I did not create you to have trouble. I did not create you to be bound by anything, no limitations whatsoever. Not limited. As you begin to speak over yourself those things that I declare over you, ha, those situations will change in your life, and those things that kept you bound will be loosed off of you in the name of Jesus. Ha, ha, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I know, I know, I know that you're sick and tired. Ha, ha. Sick and tired of checking. Ha, ha. Checking your blood level. Ta, checking that insulin level within your blood. But ha, simrona kista karata, lebre tista kashana. And you'll not have to check. You'll not have to check in the days coming forth because you're going to know. Ha, simrondo kashalite, brende kastonombre, ha, ha. Yeah, you're going to know, and the inward man, eh, sebra sota shikata. Yeah, you're going to know in the inward man that things are changing. Ha, huh. yeah, 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 because you're going to know that the real you, yep, yep, yeah, we've talked about this before, saith the Lord. You and I have had discussions about this before, that the real man on the inside, ha, huh, is not affected whatsoever by what the outer man is trying to tell you. So the inward man is taking dominance, dominance, dominance over that outward man, ha, huh, and those things are changing now as we speak. In Jesus' name, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Ha, se brasi mosta ki celebro rosa, ande brese kin de la shikote te. Ah, bre, ah, bre, ah, ha, ya, he, he, brosu na sekite te. Ha, you've been told some things by the medical community. Ha, ha, yeah, 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 and those are the facts. Ha. But you need to live by the truth, says the Lord. And the truth says that you are the healed. You're not trying to get healed, but you are the healed. And you need to begin to speak the truth ha, over your life. You need to begin to declare the truth, even in your conversations with others. Do not rehearse ha, those things that the medical community has said, but speak the truth of what I have said and what is true in your life, because you're my son. And all the things that I took upon myself upon the cross are yours today if you believe in your heart that they're yours in Jesus' name. Ha ha, thank you, Jesus. 